Hi everyone in um, North America, Europe, Romania, and uh, anywhere in the world. Thank you for watching. We are starting today the new season of Leon Ferraru conference series, and we are very excited to have seen that uh, the first season was um, very well uh, received, and we have um, we have received a lot of um, a lot of uh, nice words, kind words, and um, a very good um, response. Uh, we are thankful to all of our um, watchers, viewers for this um, for this um, amazing um, amazing world. Uh, we are um, for for the past weeks we have been um, said repeatedly that uh, everything we do at the Romanian Cultural Institute during this time is uh, dedicated to um, medical doctors, nurses, essential personnel. Um, those who are uh, putting their lives uh, on the line so that we are uh, safe. And especially to, uh, because there are many, uh, Romanian uh, American and Romanian Canadian who are putting their lives on the line so that we uh, keep uh, safe. Uh, I th we think it's uh, now time to um, give a voice and put a face uh, to these uh, to these uh, people who have uh, done this extraordinary, amazing, uh, amazing job uh, during this uh, this past month uh, months, and we um, uh, we um, consider it apt to start with uh, somebody uh, I would uh, call very bluntly, pure and simple, a hero. Although I know. Uh, he will uh, immediately reject, shake off this, uh, uh, this notion. And uh, although I know that I will be still uh, using this, uh, uh, this notion. And my first guest is um, Dr. Um, Theo Trandafirescu, uh, one of the most respected uh, medical specialists uh, specialist in, uh, in New York, a man who for the past months has um, uh, has looked uh, death uh, in the eyes. Has been on the forefront of the fight of the uh, of Corona of the virus uh, uh, um, Corona uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, I would say he was uh, in one of the most I should say perilous uh, situation. Uh, an individual. Uh, uh, could have been uh, during this um, during this month, uh, Dr. Trandafirescu. Thank you for being uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, we know you are very very busy, and uh, and the more so we are we are thankful for having accepted our invitation. Thank you for uh, invitation and for introduction. Uh, we'll have we'll have a productive one hour. We'll share our experiences. <laughs> Definitely, we uh, we we are very excited uh, to to have you in the in the program. Um, Dr. Uh, Trandafirescu is um, a specialist in um, internal um, medicine. Um, I should say is uh, one of the most respected uh, specialists uh, in New York, with more than twenty five years of um, of um, experience and um, a professor at um, top medical schools in uh, New York. He graduated um, Ovidius uh, University in Constanza in uh, 1995. Um, he did um, a series of um, uh, specializations, training programs uh, in the United States, in New York, um, among which uh, one fellowship at Montefiore Medical Center's Albert Einstein College of uh, Medicine. He also taught at uh, Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine from 2004 to 2016. Um, he did also a, um, a training program at the St. Vincent uh, Catholic uh, Medical Center and, uh, and many others. Uh, from uh, 2016, he um, teaches um, medicine at uh, Mount Sinai uh, Medical School and as a practitioner is um, affiliated with um, Queen's, um, uh, Queen's Hospital Center, uh, 
um, as everybody knows, one of the most dangerous uh, place in New York, in America, everywhere in the world uh, during this time. Uh, Dr. Tranda Firescu, again, uh, thank you for being uh, with us uh, this afternoon. And I will start uh, by um, asking how, how is it to, uh, to look death in the eye every day? Because you have seen, you have seen during these uh, months, um, all the several uh and uh and every day every day you confront it uh the virus you confront it the dreadful uh the dreadful effects of this uh, virus how is it to look death in the eyes every day all healthcare practitioners and all public servants are heroes we have We've had weeks of adrenaline-driven heroism in our healthcare. With that easing, medical staff is able to process what's being on right now. It cannot be overstated how unprecedented this pandemic is and how it affects all disciplines across healthcare in the United States and all over the world. This virus is not only new from a medical standpoint, but it is a threat to our health care, to the health of our loved ones, elderly parents, children, family, friends, to everybody. I think that adds on a different dimension of the emotional and psychological toll it takes to run towards hot zones like emergency department, ICU, medical, surgical floors with uh, a lot of COVID patients. In general, we are used to illness and death in healthcare, but what this pandemic has done is almost like drinking out of a fire hose in terms of volume of critical illness and death. Nobody can be prepared for that. We are seeing so much death, grief, and stress, all while not being able to sleep, eat healthy, or exercise, while working these long hours. All this takes a toll on you in general. What is specific with COVID infection, it is the volume and the type of patients that we are having it. Due to contagious airborne droplet nature of this disease, ICU rules are more difficult. We need more protective equipment, PPE, we have to be more cautious. We need more resources and it's more timing consuming procedures treating these patients. Uh, due to this high mortality and morbidity, critical care has a lot of emotional component with this high burnout for intensities. These patients in ICU, they have a very high morbidity and mortality rate. So from the beginning of our career, we know that we have to deal with high intensity, morbidity, mortality, but to this degree, it was unprecedented, at least for me. Uh, we are not God, but we try to support life with what medicine can offer and deliver, at least at this time. It's slowing down, a little bit slowing down, but it was unprecedented experience, traumatic experience. Uh, we we will be talking about this uh, this aspect, but for the moment, let us know how does a day in the life of a medical practitioner on the very front of the fight against uh, the virus look like? Uh, take us through the whole uh, the whole day because. Uh, we feel that even though everybody knows that, you know, medical doctors, nurses, medical persons, uh, amazing job, probably they don't understand, um, don't understand how the days of these um, courageous people look like. It is an excellent question because most of the society are not healthcare practitioners and news outlets and medias have not been allowed inside hospitals. Yes. So um, uh, I, let me paint it for you what the typical day of intensivist of us is like. So wake up, shower, 
coffee, scrubs, grab a mask, drive to work, enjoy the callous roads, which are very welcome for a New Yorker, less cars on the road, enter the hospital, symptoms and fever check, put your N95 mask on, add goggles, add gowns, and uh, every day, let's hope I don't get infected today. That's the fear. Get sign out from the night shift and uh, go over the, the, the day list. Who's dying? Has family been called? Who needs dialysis? Who needs to be prone a position to improve oxygenation and ventilation? Who can be weaned from the ventilators? Has all the consultants in patients? What COVID treatment antiviral and anti-inflammatory is getting now? We're getting phone calls from in-house and surrounding hospitals flooding in. Do we have enough nurses? Do we have enough vents? Do we have any potential transfers? In the middle of this, you take a 15, 20 minutes break, remove gowns, remove all protective equipment. Somebody do donated lunch and appreciated all the society who donated lunch to the hospitals and healthcare workers. Again, put your protective equipment in, gown, mask, uh, parper, it's a big mask on your head if you have to intubate to do a procedure. Let's say you hear a CPR, a rest code overhead, another patient most likely is dying. How we can do better? Start questioning ourselves. Less diuretics, less positive pressure. Use paralytics to improve oxygenation or ventilation. Consider ECMO, an extracorporeal circulation for very selective cases. Uh, ER is calling you in the meantime with another admission. Another admission, another young patient. How is this possible? We have so many patients coming. Let's get phones so we can FaceTime family with loved ones. So we try to do a FaceTime call for the patients. It's very understandable. They are panicky patients, family, everybody, because of this lack of transparency. Wash hands again and again, wash hands again and again. I can start seeing my high school chin notes on the palm of my hands. So 12 hours passed, no one here, go home, see family, if you are lucky, fragmented sleep and repeat it again in the morning. That's usually it was on the peak of the of the COVID, it, it was very high intensity rhythm and very traumatic rhythm. I, I just tried to paint it in a, in, in a nice way, fragmented, just, just to say how it was. It's nothing nice in what you have uh, painted, but what you are doing is very nice because to live day after day, 12, hour, the, uh, 12 hours a day, under this pressure, uh, um, uh, um, running all the time, uh, always careful just to take care of many, many uh, the patients, uh, many more coming in. I think it's, uh, it's kind of uh, tough. And even though you, uh, you um, described it so um, um, in, in so technical and clear terms, uh, I think everybody could uh, could um, grasp the, the the tension, the the stress, uh, the tiredness that uh, that uh, is behind these uh, these days. But tell me, uh, weren't you afraid that you would bring the virus back home to your family? Uh, that somehow you might have caught the virus, or uh, it's uh, you know on your uh, on your things, and and you can. Um, you can make your family sick. Always is this fear of getting the virus for myself, for my family, and for the loved ones, and for the society in general. So I'm trying to be as cautious as I can. Can I be protective 100%? No. But I'm trying to maximize this protection with all these equipment, mask, face, washing hands, washing hands, everything. So I'm, I'm trying to, to, to be compliant with the, all the protective equipment regulations. And I'm using it, even if they do not recommend I'm using it. Double mask, triple mask sometimes when I have to do procedures and just go on. Thank God nothing has happened uh, with you and your wonderful, uh, wonderful family. Um, just to remind uh, our viewers that they can um, 
ask uh, questions on our uh, Facebook page. We will uh, try to uh, to take as many as we uh, can during our um, uh, our conversation. Uh, I'd like to uh, go back a little bit uh, to uh, Romania uh, and uh, ask you, um, do you think that your medical school at home, and Romania has for many, many decades considered of having a very, uh, very strong medical tra tradition, do you think that um, this uh, medical tradition, the school that you uh, started in Romania uh, has prepared you well for what, uh, what uh, awaited you in the United States in your uh, long career as a medical specialist and especially during this uh, time of crisis? Definitely. I'm pretty sure that all my Romanian colleagues medical school colleagues should have done the same like uh, all of us, we are here. I'm just uh, one of the lucky immigrant doctors who is practicing in New York. And uh, I'm, uh, again, I'm lucky that I'm here. All my colleagues should have done the same type of uh, medical performance, the same type of dedication. I know them very well. I'm very proud that I'm Romanian and I think the uh, Romanian medical export of human resources all over, not necessarily in the United States, I think the whole Europe, it, it was the most productive and high quality exports. I think they should increase the taxes to all these medical exports, the government. It's a high quality and very appreciated uh, export that Romania did. To be more specific, I was lucky also to have a very specific ICU training and subsequent experience in one of the best critical care systems in the world at Albert Einstein at Montefiore. My boss at that time, Dr. Vladimir Vetan, he was from Czech Republic, where high school was from Austria. He did his high school there and medical school here at Columbia. May he rest in peace was one of the world leaders in critical care and disaster medicine, and he prepared us. So I was lucky by being a Romanian, trained in Romania with good values and very good educational system, and lucky to have a good training here. Uh, usually to say that you are a Romanian doctor in in United States means definitely a professionalism warranty. I think attitude and motivation, determination are important in any career, and also in medicine too. Um, I, um, going back to the, the current uh, the situation, um, we have uh, learned about your um, um, hectic uh, schedule and the, 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 risk, the risks um, uh, a day at the work uh, entail in, in, uh, in, in your case. Uh, could you share with us some of the most difficult you have been through during this time? Uh, so, some moments then when you thought, uh, oh my God, this is really too much. There are many moments like this, but uh, there is a lot of stress and uh, chaos uh, working in this uh, COVID critical care. Uh, you are uncertain about what it will happen. I trained for years to make a diagnosis and to provide people the correct treatment that makes them better. That was my, uh, my intention and that's what I trained for. With this COVID disease, no matter, no matter what we did, some patients worsened. That creates a sense of helplessness and it was abnormal for me and for everybody in healthcare, critical care, emergency room, on the frontliners, who are used to making people better. So this sense of helplessness, it was pretty damaging to our uh, emotion. To be more specific about these uh, moments, for the patients and loved ones who were in the hospitals, fear of death, fear of loss of loved ones, guilt, separation anxiety, job insecurity, depression, indignation, confusion, a mix of all of the above. Uh, for healthcare practitioners, doctors, and all healthcare practitioners, stress, emotional and physical collapse, unhealthy behaviors, depression, frustration with treatments and the volume and 
the, 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 this this organization of hospital admissions to this high volume and high acuity, fear of infection and infecting the loved ones, social isolation, boredom, insomnia. Uh, what we neglect to dispense, however, is this mental care, our own, uh, that of the awake patient in the hospital with COVID, the family, our family, family patients, and also this uh, mental care of the society at large. Uh, another painful moment, I think, it's um, this pandemic is robbing us, society, of the ritual what we process grief, embracing one another and gathering for memorials. Very painful. We had a high mortality. They were not able of seeing their their loved ones. They are not able of doing a, 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 a memorial for them. So the dignity was lost during all this time, which I think it's a very painful moment too. I'm, I'm always struck by, by, your, by your words um, because they are coming from a practitioner that, um, uh, that um, works in a, in, a, in a medical front uh, that is always a bit uh, risky. I mean, you have specialized in, um, in um, a critical, um, a critical care medicine, in uh, pulmonary diseases, uh, so uh, uh, complicated, uh, complicated um, uh, diseases and also uh, um, dangerous uh, diseases. And to, uh, to, uh, when you speak about this cocktail of emotions, fears, indignation, uh, tiredness, all, all this, it's, um, it's the more, uh, it's the more um, overwhelming, I, I should say. Um, how do you think these months when you were uh, experiencing all these, uh, these things uh, will be changing you uh, as, a, as a medical practitioner? Uh, or indeed the medical profession itself, do you think it will leave a mark on yourself um, as a highly respected expert, you know, working in a, in a very specialized, um, uh, specialized uh, uh, discipline of, uh, of the medical profession and for the, um, uh, the medical pro profession itself? Uh, you are right, and you put it right. This cocktail of emotions will uh, will uh, make some wounds on our uh, on our uh, life, definitely. Uh, critical care is medical specialty that deals with critical patients, condition they are life threatening, provides life support, invasive monitoring technique, procedure, CPR, resuscitation, and end of life care with dignity care. Is changing? Yes, it will change. To what degree? We don't know. Time probably will let us know. But frontline health providers, we find ourselves consumed in this providing medical care, intubation, central lines, uh, feeding to placements, ventilators, uh, oxygenators, medicating, rounding to ensure that changes in condition are readily noted and we act upon these changing conditions. In general, medicine has a broad spectrum of practices and practitioners, but the love for science need to be useful for society and to have compassion all the time stay the same. This one will stay the same. It will change medicine. It will be more telemedicine, more technology, more infectious and more transmissible disease awareness, more disaster medicine and health policy response feedback response from the governments. Probably there will be created more tracing jobs and exposures. So the healthcare will be designed probably towards more um, tracing epidemiology type of uh, resources. Also, it will change how we see medicine. The, the simple example will have more home available diagnostic tests and tools. Uh, will will start screening for infectious diseases, having a kit at our home, bringing to the doctor, the same like we screen for pregnancy test type. You'll have it at home, you will deliver. Um, probably will have more televisits with AAA therapy of antibiotics, analgetics, and uh, advice from doctors. 
the patients are uh, are scared to come to the doctors not to get infected so it's a, it's a fear in our blood like practitioners and like society in general so it will affect us uh, it's very painful it's very painful uh, medicine and civil societies will take appropriate feedback response it will be a different response depends on your personal perception of diseases and person, personal experience. I think the future will depend uh, if big international academic centers, medical organizations, countries will want to cooperate for this progress of science or they will start ego competition game based on their institution driven agenda. So. The answer, the answer probably it will be on, on us. Time will give us a more, more detailed and more specific answer. I hope so. Yeah, but you have picture of a very complex, uh, complex uh, situation and um, probably a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the vectors of this uh, change will, uh, uh, will uh, manifest themselves in the, the following months and, uh, and years. Um, you wake up, uh, drive to the hospital, and start the fight with this um, silent and dangerous killer every day. Every day, you are risking your life. You and your colleagues are doing whatever you can in order to save lives. Uh, it's a, as you described it, a hugely risky um a situation and uh, and uh, and profession it's on uh, it's facing death uh, frankly uh, every day but we've heard of cases of um, uh, representatives of the medical profession doctors nurses who have um, run away from their uh, resp responsibilities who have um, decided that they wouldn't uh they wouldn't um work in these dangerous environments, they, they wouldn't uh, continue their uh, practice. Um, what, what did you think when, uh, when, you, when you heard about these uh, situations as a doctor? It is difficult to judge my colleagues and their circumstances. Uh, each doctor medical practitioner has his own personal story and his own personal experience. I will go case by case. Uh, let me share my personal, my personal perspective at my institution. So here at my hospital, we are not allowed to, date, to take days off. So it was very clear for the next couple of weeks and month, you are not supposed to take days off unless you are sick, which is okay. You, 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 you take a medical leave. Uh, but in our pulmonary and critical care group, we decided that most vulnerable colleagues not to be exposed to this COVID. So the persons in our group, practitioners, doctors who are elderly and they had comorbidities, mm -hmm. it was our friendly and collegial decision not to expose them to COVID. So what we did? We, we asked them to do a lot of phone visits, staying by phone and direct all the clinic, all the outpatient type of advice that you can do it. Coordinate medical care, primary care, primary pulmonary clinics, coordinate this care. It was not an administration executive decision. It was our own personal. So what I think, uh, administrations, they will put pressure on you to deliver medical services. Your conscience will tell you to do medical services, but not all the time you, you can do medical services. There are specific circumstances. If you are sick and you have a lot of comorbidities, probably you want that person to not to be exposed. You want to protect that person. So number one rule in any epidemics is to protect the protectors. So if you feel that somebody is at risk, probably it's better to protect. So I will go case by case in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in these situations. And uh, really uh, very difficult to judge my colleagues. That, that's another thing. So we have our Hippocratic uh, oath, but the same one, the same one we have in the same time we have our uh, 
colleague type of attitude. We are in the same in the same boat, all of us. We are in the same uh, situation, all of us. Yeah. And so every case must be judged uh, individually. Yes, definitely. Uh, there are specific circumstances. I'm pretty sure there are. Uh, let's let's take some uh, some questions because we promised at the beginning of our program that uh, that we'll be taking some uh, questions. Uh, Luca asks, um, "What would you say to those who still don't believe how serious this is? How can we convince our community that this is deadly?" I think uh, information and education are like in any circumstances, uh, the most important ones. Uh, if you are exposed to an area with high prevalence and incidence of diseases, probably you don't need any more convincing data. If you are in an area with this more like, liberal, more like, Let's lucky, say New York, right? Let's say New York. <laughs> no, in New York, I, I don't think it's un, un, undeniable in New York. I mean, all of us, we, we've got this experience. You go and probably a friend, a relative, somebody got more or less affected. So New York, uh, look on the data that we have it here, morbidity and mortality, which is like, uh, we got hit pretty hard. If you are in an area which lucky enough, there are not too many cases and you get your information from a specific social media, your own group, and you don't have such a broad vision, you have an unilateral vision, I would recommend to look twice, to think twice and to try to be more open-minded. I, I'm pretty sure everybody is smart. Depends how you how how you get your information and how how you put it this information, but it, it, it's a reality. It's undeniable. I mean, the the way you describe it, and uh, by living in New York, you know, we all know. Or it's not only New York. I mean, it's uh, it's Italy, it's Spain, it's Romania, of right. course, our own country. So, um, yeah, but information and education and the right sources of information and comparing, comparing all these sources of information and looking for authority who's sending this information is always a good, uh, a good advice. Um, we are facing uh, one of the greatest crises in living memory uh, for probably for our generation is the biggest, uh, the biggest crisis. A lot of people, you know, with the exception of those who went through the Second World War or other big wars, have not seen anything like this, and society has not been confronted with anything like this. Um, do you think that um, world will be um, uh, will be transformed by this uh, by this uh, global shock? Because I think it's a global shock. Uh, do you think we will be more tolerant or less tolerant to risk? We will be more, um, I don't know, um, our attitude towards death and, uh, and illness uh, will change uh, given this um, outstanding situation that we are uh, passing through? Again, time probably will give us a more specific and appropriate answer. But uh, we are a mix of generations from millennials, Generation X, baby boomers, etc., with different perspective and visions of real life and virtual life, computer life. So uh, our perception is different. How we can find the universal truth about how societies respond to contagious epidemic diseases very difficult to answer and again it's uh, based on uh, on education exposure uh, age uh, experience but usually epidemics they unfold the social drama in three acts the first one is the earliest signs are very elusive nobody believes it they are whether influenced by a desire for self reassurance or a need to protect some economic interest citizens usually ignore clues that something is not good until the acceleration of illness, the diseases and death are coming and they force for this acknowledgement. This is part one of this uh, social drama. After that is coming part two, recognition, launches the second act in which people demand and offer explanations. 
everybody is an expert at this time of our diseases. It's based on personal perception, we just discussed. And these are done both, both uh, morally and mechanistically, spanner reflexes sometimes. Explanations in turn generate a lot of public responses. So if everybody is trying to explain something, it will generate an, a, a very big response from the public. This is the second phase. And the third phase of this social drama, probably it's the third act, it's as dramatic, as disruptive as the diseases itself, the panic and distress in society can be more damaging. Are we able to react? Are we able to have our feedback, appropriate feedback? That's where we are right now. Probably we are able of limiting the diseases. We are doing, okay, we respond acute, at least in New York, and uh, finally we contain, partially contain it. But this general anxiety and fear is causing more drama and is more disruptive to our society. Will we do the best thing just to organize ourselves and uh, go back to a new normal? We'll see. Again, time will give us an answer. We'll see. Uh, it's it's true. Uh, we uh, we live in a time of uh, great uncertainty, and that's why it's always, again, risky to uh, to tell very uh, you know to be very sure of uh, of oneself about uh, about the outcome of this uh, this crisis. But we are starting to see a little bit of uh, the end of the um, the tunnel, I think. And now uh, now I think we are. Um, we, especially here in New York, uh, we have passed the, the most dramatic, most tragic, in fact, most tragic part of the, of the pandemic. Um, I, I'd like to ask now going into some um, the medical, uh, medical aspects. Uh, what do you think right now, as we stand today, is the best protocol in fighting the, um, uh, the most serious cases of, uh, um, of COVID-19. Not talking about those who, yes, it's a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult disease, it's a painful disease, but still some are at home. But when people arrive at, um, at, the, at the hospitals, what is, what is the best protocol now? Uh, are, are you better now after these months of fighting the uh, the virus? Do you know more what you have to do? It's more effective uh, what, you, what you are doing every day? Yes, I, I think we know more about the viruses. The medical scientific world responded tremendous to all this crisis. Everything it's all about COVID. Maybe it's too much response because we neglect the other diseases, the, the other healthcare uh, specialties and then and, and programs but the the response it was overwhelming from medical uh, societies and uh, we know more we know more still we are on the learning curve still we are learning a lot about these diseases but morbidity and mortality is less than how it was two months ago due to advancing medicine advancing supportive therapy and the uh, multidisciplinary approach so you uh, you are when you start your difficult days you are no you are now more confident way more confident that you will be able to save lives uh, at the end of the day. Not way more confident, but more confident okay. probably that we, we we advanced. We are more prepared. Definitely, we are more prepared than two months ago, medically, logistically, and like a healthcare system and like a society in general. Uh, everything it's all about COVID. We neglected the other, the other, uh, the, the other diseases and the other medical conditions. Uh, let's take another question. Um, what can non-medical people do to help? Um, do the nightly cheers help, um, or should people do something else? What do you think? A good attitude will help in any time and in any society. Probably the best way is to support the elderly and the people with comorbidities. Go online, check on the most vulnerable type of patients, 
most of the vulnerable type of segment of our society, elderly, comorbidities, and uh, try to help them online. Uh, provide food for them, uh, start a uh, positive uh, online application, try to do some teaching and education for the young generation, try to educate people about um, ethics in general, about what you are an expert on. So, so take advantage of your expertise like a person and share it with the others and start with helping the most vulnerable type of patients, elderly, and comor the patients with comorbidities. Uh, indeed, there are so many things uh, one can do outside the medical profession in order to, uh, to fight the, the crisis. And we have seen, I mean, from um, essential workers uh, doing non-medical uh, non work, but also for private individuals, or organizations mobilizing and doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of things. How do you feel about the cheers? About that? The cheers every every evening at seven o'clock, New York. Definitely, it's, it's a very it's a very positive feedback for everybody. Definitely, it's a recognition for the healthcare and the the public servants. It's uh, it, it feels good, and uh, we should. Uh, is the good part of the society. It's the positive uh, from all of us. We have to bring the positive from all of us to into 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 all of our societies, not only in the United States, all over, and try to share this positiveness of, in our hearts. Uh, it, it feels good to, to do it as well, not only to, uh, to receive it. And I think it's a very, uh, it's a very yeah. nice, uh, nice custom. Another question uh, from uh, Nicole mm -hmm. Marge uh, asks, does the doctor feel, does you feel that, uh, uh, do you feel that if we reopen too soon, uh, that will cause a relapse? Oh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, l l l let me give you a more elaborate answer because it's, it's not an, it's a good question, but not a simple answer here. So before we, questions now. Uh, before we reopen and before we de-escalate, it was a, a very, a lockdown, right? Very, uh, very painful lockdown. So in pure mathematical terms, decision to lock down was binary decision, yes or no. It was a very painful decision, but easy to make. Let me close, let me contain the infection, let me contain the viruses. Reopening, on the other hand, lacks this switch on simplicity. So it's not a simple decision. It's an artful decision with many variables that uh, mandates rational, nuance, vigilance, preparedness for retreat, and a lot of metrics, a lot of information. So preparedness for retreat, each society, each political leader has to be prepared for retreating to these circumstances. Depends on how the public will react. If still we are very responsible, very intelligent socially and very vigilant, probably it will be okay. If we have a reckless behavior, we don't know, probably it will not be okay. Usually I think there are four phases, like in phase one, you reopen construction, manufacturing. In phase two, you go to financial and professional services, real estate. In phase three, restaurants, hotels. And in uh, phase four, you go to arts, education, and entertainment. It's very painful that arts and education, we are talking right now, they are the fourth one to, to be reopened, but always the society, so you, we got punished a lot uh, uh, by society. All of them, they can mix uh, the, the, these phases. So the answer probably an, 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 an mayor or a uh, public figure, a politician, a president will be better than me, definitely better than me to answer how they should do. But to be prepared to retreat anytime, probably it's a very smart and cautious measure. From medical point of view, the hospital, when you reopen in your area, you want to be sure that you have only 70% occupation rate of your ICU and floor bed. So you have room to deal with a big wave of sick people coming to your place. You want to be sure like a hospital, you have more than 90 days, three months supply of protective 
equipment, PP, how we are told, how we are calling. Well, you want to be sure you have enough tests to, to screen off all of your population. So decision to de-escalate, to reopen is based also on these epidemiology types of data. How many cases are in your society, in your area, and then how they spread, they do all this tracing. So it is not a simple decision, multiple variables, but desire to reopen all of us, we have it. Nobody can, can deny our desire to come back to normality or to new normality. So you are, uh, uh, you are advocating caution, you have, are advocating uh, a phased uh, reopening, you are advocating measures like masks and social distancing, at least for a while until we, uh, we, have, uh, we have the vaccine. And by the way, how, um, how far do you think um, are we from a vaccine? Oh, it's a good question because it's part of reopening. So um, there are two ways of making people healthier. One, you give vaccine when you are a kid to protect for all these infectious diseases and the other one to increase immunity. I'm a big, a big, uh, I'm in big favor for this increasing immunity by healthy lifestyles with a very good diet, rich in vegetables, fruits, vitamins, reduce stress, reduce these unhealthy habits, good and quality sleep patterns, mental relaxation, relaxation and so on. So we can increase our immunity. If we cannot, we have to do vaccine. Here it's an ethical question. Let's say if we have a vaccine, do we believe that the whole world is ready to have vaccine? We have vaccine for all these measles, rubeola, influenza, and still a lot of media and a lot of social media, they're against it. So it's a matter of compliance. It's a matter of ethics. But medically speaking, to do a vaccine on the fast pace, on a super fast pace, probably you need a minimum of 12 to 18 months. In the past, for all these uh, infections, childhood immunization took years to, to generate a, a vaccine. Principles of vaccines are um, based on administration to volunteers of inactivated viruses, live alternated viruses, or part of this uh, antigen. And the whole idea is to produce an immunologic response to produce an antibody response. And this antibody response, we will hope that it will be protective for a long period of time or lifelong. So each infectious has his own response, immunologic response. Some of them, they are protective for life. They say measles, rubeola, rujola. Some of them, they are protective for one month or a couple of months like influenza. Some of them, they are 30% protect, protective, some of them 70% protective. Uh, so you have to recruit volunteers, you have to test them and wait for response. It's a very long process. It's a long, elaborate, scientific, logistically, legally, ethically process. But the basic rule is do not harm the patients. That's the basic principle of vaccine. Do not harm population. That's the most important act. Uh, uh, aspect of doing vaccines. Right now we are in an, a list on the oncology. In the last couple of years, it was a genetic revolution with a lot of uh, genome manipulation to treat cancer diseases in general. So what we are trying right now to go on the fast pace is to, man to, to, trans to, to uh, transpolate from uh, oncology field to infectious field and try to do this messenger RNA or parts of this messenger RNA to create this immunologic response. And as you can see, I think yesterday it was the big success. I don't want to name the company, but stocks went already 30% up. The biggest news, they already they have their antibodies, but they are working on the fast track on this uh, manipulation of messenger RNA. And it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, debate here. Can we manipulate our genome? Can we use it against us? So it's a lot of ethical question and it will generate a lot of public debate, as you can see. But uh, how far we are, 
I don't know. Mm -hmm. the but, President Trump, he's very optimistic, so he wants to do it uh, pretty fast, and he mobilized uh, a lot of uh, a lot of personnel to 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 have a new vaccine. The the idea that it's going to be very uh, fast uh, is, um, of course, everybody wants to have it fast. But uh, probably, as you say, it will uh, it will take some time until we will know for sure whether the vaccine or vaccines that are on the on the market are really safe for uh, for all of us or are really efficient. Uh, they, uh, right. they truly uh, truly work. Looking back at this um, at this time of fighting uh, fighting the virus throughout the world, uh, one can see that um, some countries, some states, um, managed to do it better than our, than others. Uh, managed to uh, um, to diminish the, the number of um, of fatalities or to mobilize uh, better. Uh, what do you think that was? Uh, because um, institutions, because of medical practices, because of culture, culture defined in the broader sense, way of life, uh, um, pref uh, social preferences, and uh, and so on. How do you explain these variations? You are right. We have a great variation between states, between. Uh... Uh, countries in number of cases, fatalities, morbidity, mortality. Uh, in the United States, I think we have a very heterogeneous population by uh, culture, by density, by, um, by uh, perceptions of, uh, of life and healthy lifestyle too. There are several reasons why New York has become an United States and probably all over the world epicenter of this pandemic. Uh, why I think it's the most populous city in the United States, New York. Um, it's a most, among most densely populated city in the United States. I said Manhattan has a density of more than 60,000 people per square uh, feet, highest in any country. Uh, so it's highest from all over. This density put us at risk. We have high contact. We live in crowded buildings. We run into each other on sidewalks. We squeeze like sardines in the busiest subways. And we brush and uh, elbow and crowd it ourselves in bars, restaurants, events, museums. And actually, it's the funny part. We enjoy it. This is New York spirit to, 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 to be very heterogeneous. But at this time, being so crowded uh, put us at risk. So uh, the countries who they did a lot of social measures based on this social uh, dist distance and uh, very strong rules, they did better. Probably that was the most preventive measure and the most important one, how to contain it. For us, we are very dense. We like to socialize, typical New Yorkers. We have a lot of... Uh, a lot of places, cultural places, food places, the more diversity in the world. And in Manhattan, it's very crowded, this reality. And also we are one of the most touristic places in, in the world. We are a major transit hub. We have thousands of people from China, from Italy, from South Korea visited us in weeks, in months for the New Year's uh, Eve, December, January, they were the busiest months. So, uh, we live in a big city. We are proud of our city. It's our New York state of mind. But I think this one put us, put us at risk of developing all these pandemics. We are not able to contain it in, 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 the, in the right time. So this is the, the critical factor. And we will see what happens now that slowly New York State and then, um, then New York City uh, Will uh, slowly will slowly re reopen, uh, uh, Dr. Trandafirescu. It's been a fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, discussion. I know that you are busy, and uh, we are so so grateful for everything you and your colleagues uh, have done on, and are doing and will be doing uh, to uh, to keep us uh, safe. It's been quite an honor to uh, to talk to you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, every every viewer and indeed everybody 
um, applauds and admires what uh, what you and your colleagues are doing in this very difficult situation that you have described so graphically and so frighteningly. Uh, so thank you for being these, uh, with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, take care of yourself, uh, take care of, uh, of your family, of your colleagues, uh, continue to do this uh, good work, this necessary work uh, that you've been we, 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 you've been doing and you'll be doing um, uh, in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor and a privilege and keep spirit high to everybody, to New Yorkers, to Romanians, to everybody. And it's an excellent job that you are promoting high spirit in, uh, in this world right now. So keep the spirit ongoing. We try to do it, but of course, um, uh, you know, we are very much aware that the real fight is uh, fought uh, in, in hospitals with uh, courageous people like you and your uh, college. And to all our uh, viewers, um, stay safe, um, stay in touch, um, and uh, continue to enjoy what you what we have um, uh, to offer on our online um, uh, program. It's always uh, it's always great to see uh, the great response um, uh, we are receiving. But not we, our interlocutors. Uh, and artists and everybody who are part of these uh, programs are receiving uh, in North America and through all the world. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.